We're back for North and South now, moving right along with the Avatar comics. My memory of this one is hazy. Once again, I think I remember some large beats, but I think the one I remember the best is the one after this, Imbalance. I do have a general good feeling about this one in the back of my head, though, so I feel like I must have liked it on some level when I first read it. But my opinions on things do tend to radically change over time, so let's see how I feel now. We start on a Katara flashback. Kaya, Katara's mom, is waking her up to show her the new snowfall, which, since the village is made out of snow, makes the whole thing look freshly built. A little Katara's pumped to see the new snowfall and kaya hits her with the wake up but i'm already awake wake up what wake up oh i hate that that freaks me out for some reason the way the art for kaya didn't change at all in the three panels gives me the willies for some reason so it wasn't a flashback it was a dream and it's actually sokka telling her to wake up katara's like oh man turns out that they're here if you recall these two and ang split up last comic for ang to go help zuko and these guys to head back to the south pole for a visit oh are they home this doesn't look very south polish to me and katara agrees but sokka insists she's always saying no one can read a map like him this line is, of course, a reference to Katara saying this exact line in the episode Sokka's Master. No one can read a map like you. Anyway, Katara spots some penguin sledders and asks if it reminds Sokka of anything, and Sokka's like, nah, no. Of course, it's the day they met Aang, and Sokka gives Katara the gears a little bit here, saying that she thought Aang was a spy for the Fire Navy, which is, of course, the opposite of what happened. Katara says, come on, let's have a go, and she has a great time, but Sokka does not. Come on, Sokka, you've been on rougher rides than this. Sokka classically Sokka's himself into a giant wooden beam sticking out of the ground, and it turns out it's part of the framework to a new building. Not even like a snow building. They have buildings here that don't melt. Sokka asks a passing kid what the building is going to be, but the kid says, I ain't talking to strangers. And Sokka is very rightfully like, stranger, I'm Sokka of the Southern Water Tribe. I should almost be like a folk hero to you guys. So the kid's like, oh, word, you're from here? Tight, let's game. But that gets interrupted quickly by some construction workers coming over and giving them a hard time. The sign said no trespassing, but this kid was using said sign as a shield for the snow warrior. And you can even see that he's using it a couple pages back, which which is a nice touch. Katara says, yeah, we'll split our bad, but this guy, the man with the most detailed face in Avatar, remarks that this is the third infraction this week, so wait, no, not the waist high wave, no, they're just kids! But Katara, in her utter mastery of the martial art, can now even defend against the all-powerful waist high wave. Wow, what a crazy feat. Remember to argue this in all of your weird internet power level debates. Katara's mad that three grown men are attacking a bunch of kids, but I mean, it was only detailed face. What if the other two were like, whoa, detailed face, chill out. Regardless, Katara says, I'll show you how to fucking water bend, detailed face, and the Ashman catch Katara's consecutive normal snowballs and make a very large snowball. That Katara then, of course, makes into a very large spiky snowball. If it's just made out of snow, does that really make it any more formidable? Apparently so, because the workers are just like, Jesus, all right, relax. I also like that Sokka is like Katara's biggest fan in all of these shots. That's nice. The workers say that they were just going to scare the kids, and Katara says to put up a fence. A fence? Where are we supposed to get the materials for that? There's no wood or cement bricks or highly bendable snow around. Sokka says, all right, all right, we'll walk you guys home. Where do you live? In the the kid points towards Katara and Sokka's village, which they find weird. Who are these kids' parents? But the kids are also confused. What do you mean village? You mean the city? What do you mean city? Oh shit, Paku got down here and straightened things right up, didn't he? Damn. Katara seems unsure of how to feel about this, but Sokka, always the futurist, thinks this is the sickest shit he ever saw. They immediately see Auntie Yashuna, who isn't in the show, but her and her seal jerky were mentioned briefly last comic before these guys split off from Aang. After greetings and explaining that her jerky hut got torn down, so she runs this cart now, Ashuna shouts to everyone that Sokka and Katara are back, and damn, hold on, they are like folk heroes. Wait, hold on, yeah, yeah, that's goddamn right. Finally, some recognition out here. Forget all these nobodies, though. Grand Grand's here. Anyone remember Grand Grand? Legend. And even Paku's still kicking around. Turns out him and Grand Grand are officially married now, just a couple weeks back. Took a couple years since giving her the betrothal necklace, I guess, but it seems Paku has been busy. They didn't miss a ceremony or anything, though, because they eloped to the Misty Palms Oasis, which is the same place the gang visited in the episode The Library, where they met Professor Zay. A lot of info on this page, geez, so quick fire. Paku mentions he set up a school here in the south and he wants Katara to come help out. Sokka references how he's got experience helping teaching bending, referring back to his time at the Metal Bending Academy. And the crew get pointed toward Hakoda's office at Town Hall, which is highly surprising for a multitude of reasons. And boy, is it something. Grand Grand explains that Hakoda isn't just a local chieftain anymore, he's the chieftain of the entire Southern Water Tribe. Which is something I've wanted to mention for a while now. The extended media says that the Southern Water Tribe has always been a group of scattered, disparate, and small communities. And the show never really got into the nitty gritty about the Southern Water Tribe, well, anything really. So I always went off of what the show told me in that what was the Southern Water Tribe was the Southern Water Tribe, like this small community here was it. But now the comics say nope, there were tons more, they were just spread out, which is fine, I would say. Just with how the show told the story, I thought it was pretty clear that this was all there was. Especially with the amount of men that Hakoda led to war, maybe it was just his village that went. Anyway, Katara's pretty unsure of what to think about her dad's new shiny office. Everything here seems so unlike home. So we go in for 
a visit and Hakoda is just tickled pink to see his kids again. These comics do do reunions well, it's great. Also, Hakoda has a map of the Southern Water Tribe up on his wall here, very nice. Hakoda introduces his kids to Molina and Malik, two people from the Northern Water Tribe who are actually big fans of Sokka and Katara. Since even before the Ozai thing, all the way back when they helped save Twi and Lop. And I like this actually, they actually wear slightly more purple toned outfits, kinda like Yue did to show that they're from the North. So the three construction thugs from earlier show up and Katara classically Katara's them and stares daggers at them. Man, feels bad that the classic Sokka and the classic Katara are so wildly different. Turns out these guys are Molina and Malik's work crew, Detailed Face, Pistachio, and Sunje. Two waterbenders and an earthbender. No way, I could have never guessed this guy was from the Earth Kingdom. There's a little back and forth about the scuffle from earlier, but overall things just end with the construction guys getting an earful about the fence they didn't put up. These guys are also supposed to be some pretty premier benders, but Katara sorted them out in no time flat, but they explained that they specialize in construction bending. Interesting. They do have a strange hulkish goon look to them that I find off-putting, and Sokka agrees. So Sokka finally gets an answer to what those guys are building, it's a new office for Hakoda. Katara's relieved because she thinks this place is way too extravagant for her dad, he's not like that, he's a down-to-earth kind of guy, but nope, psych, think again, Katara, Hakoda is being built a palace. Katara is very against this idea for some reason, but Molina, being from the north, always had her chief and his family living in a palace, so it seems to make sense to her. And Hakoda says, yeah, we're sprucing this place up, and we're trying to get more involved in the world, if we need to be a little show off to other nations to get it going, let's do it. And then Sokka somehow worms his way into a consultant role in the construction, you're lucky you're a folk hero, Sokka. Molina has the idea to go out to dinner to celebrate their arrival back home, and Sokka kind of forces Katara to go along with it, so they head to Two Fish's Northern Cuisine. That's all they got? During the meal, Katara keeps just getting bad vibes all around. This Molina chick talks bad about southern food, and with the palace and all, you can tell she feels threatened by the northerners coming in and sort of doing away with their culture. Two kids working at the restaurant square up and say ready, and basically say for the motherland, which is, oh, that's never good. So the young man purposely spills a huge dish of food onto the table as a distraction, and the young woman steals Malik's briefcase. What the hell is this culinary espionage? She tries to take off, but Molina, who turns out to be a waterbender, makes her slip on some ice. But the girl's accomplice hits Molina in the back with a pod, and oh god, she's been killed! The two kids are like, we killed a lady! Cheese it! Katara and Sokka say they're on the case, they're the legendary heroes of the Southern Water Tribe after all. Sokka sees the two get on a forklift, with no forks, but skis instead, and no way to lift anything. Sokka sees them get onto some sort of ski machine. Another smack with a suitcase? Man, this kid is good with this thing. He must have been trained both classically and contemporaneously, and just like that, they're gone. Katara says, not at all, we can still get him, and yeah, cool, you made a little toboggan or whatever, but we just need something to ride on, Katara. We're on a time limit, we don't need an artisanal ice sledge. So the chase is on, the thieves notice they're being followed, so they take a jump off a cliff and gamble that the ice sled can't take the fall, and I mean, it's a good gamble, because it can't. But that's easily remedied, Katara just makes another and they're on their way, and they catch up fast, forget the engine on your ski machine, water bending seems to be better. The thieves try to peel off to the side, realizing that the sled clearly has no steering capability, so Katara pulls one of her ice slide maneuvers straight out of her fight with Azula so they can keep up the chase. Man, I really hope these kids don't think of going uphill at any point, that would probably slow Katara down at least a little bit. Oh wait, they did, but they left their ride. No, man, I mean you could've, uh, maybe it doesn't do inclines well. Well, I guess it's a foot chase now, but Katara and Sokka crest the hill and they find they're looking at the old Fire Nation raiding ship from episode 1. This panel here is even a remake of a shot from the episode. Katara says they need to look out for booby traps, as of course Aang accidentally set one off that one time, setting the whole course of the show into action now that I think about it. But Sokka says, yeah, 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 but check this out, footsteps. So they just follow those and they're good, simple. But Sokka sets off a tripwire that's at neck level. So not a tripwire, a choke wire. And it opens a pit. That seems weird. The Fire Nation installed pits into the hallways of their own ships. Sokka gets to the bottom after some tumbling and yells back he doesn't think he's the only one down here. Katara reckons that's pretty ominous, so down she goes. Turns out that deadly, deadly trap turns into a fun slot and Katara catches up pretty quick. She's met by this huge guy named Gigamongus. Nah, his name's Gilak, but I wish his name was Gigamongus. He already knows who they are, and of course he does. They're fucking kind of a big deal. Gilak tells them that he fought alongside Hakoda in the war. Hell, he was probably there on the day of Black Sun. He thinks Hakoda is a hero. Oh, okay, so this guy's chill, nice. So we explained that those kids robbed a guy and hurt a woman tonight, so we gotta get this sorted out. Gilak says, yeah, 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 but watch this, footsteps. It turns out there's a bunch of people down here telling Southern Water Tribe stories and hanging out. And there's also these two ominous pots of weapons in the corner. Gilak calls them Patriots, and oh, in media if a group is ever called Patriots, that's usually not good. Gilak goes on to explain that while traveling the world, fighting the war, he saw the winning governments of the world, those being the Fire Nation and Earth Kingdom, centered their focus around one powerful leader. He saw that the Water Tribe and their many chieftains, who saw each other as equals, were inferior. So when Hakoda was given position of head chieftain, a true head of the country, he thought it was brilliant. But now that time has passed and Hakoda started allowing the Northerners in, he doesn't think that at all anymore. He goes on to say that the South always tried 
tried their hardest to fight the war, sending men whenever they could, but the North just stayed up there, hiding behind their wall of ice. So he has no love for them at all, despite them also being water tribes. He tells them that for the self to be seen as strong like the other nations, all foreign presence needs to be eradicated. The presence of the Northerners and their culture, most of all. This will most likely mean war, so they're here to prepare. Sok and Katara try to argue that the Northerners are just trying to help, but Gilak blows a gasket and says they're just trying to make the South an imitation of the North. Which is interesting, because we know that's exactly what Katara is feeling worried about. Gilak implores them to help their cause, to help Hakoda see the light, but Sokka says we ain't doing that shit. But then, oh god, hold on, he's crazy! But Sokka, once again, is completely and utterly confident in Katara, like he doesn't even feel like he's in danger. And she does get him out of it pretty quick, but now suddenly they're the ones on the run. They're immediately met with four men in armor, the same armor that the invading water tribers used on the day of Black Sun, so it's probably some more of the same men that were there on that day. So with a wakrak and another wakrak and a clang, we're really in the thick of it, and oh god, there's a lot of them actually. Sokka kicked this guy though, so according to the logic of the comics, he can no longer fight, so that's good. And Ice Wall behind them buys them some time, but now we got this guy. You wouldn't hurt an unarmed old man, would you? I mean, I think you're underestimating Katara here, but Sokka set the precedent of not doing that back in Jet, so you're lucky. I guess it's story time first before he'll let them go. Can't you just, like, run past them? What is this? You gotta pay the troll toll? The old man's story is about a snow rat that learned to walk on its back legs. The humans found it entertaining, so they let it sit at their campfire. But after a while, the rat forgot it was a rat at all, and asked for a home and a fishing boat, and I don't really get where this is going, and a place on the tribal council. Oh, I get it. But the humans got fed up with the rat and chased him back into the cold, but the rat angrily never forgot the warmth of the fire. Sokka is completely lost, asking what this has to do with anything, and come on, Sokka, it's a metaphor. You're supposed to be a smart guy. Also, I don't think this metaphor really works for it to work. I think the rat in the story would have to have a bigger, better fire it could just leave and go home to anyway. I told you Katara didn't have the patience for this shit. Out of the way, granddad. Katara water spouts them back out of the slide entrance they came in through, and we're on our way. All right, we're good. We're good. Oh no, leopard caribou is the saber tooth moose lion problem all over again. These things are like Turbo Max Ultra Apex Predators, and they're domesticated? How did the Fire Nation last a hundred year war against these things? If the Fire Nation should be the Harpoon Ballista Nation, the Water Tribe should be the Leopard Caribou Tribe. It doesn't have to look like fucking Christmas morning, Katara. God damn, we gotta move. Oh wait, the jerky thing came back? Really? That wasn't just a throwaway thing? Sokka tosses the jerky off the sled, and the cats are like, oh shit, let me get some of that, and this time, for real, they're on their way. So we're back in town, and turns out Grand Grand's hut never got gentrified. She's a tough old bird. Sokka says, we really gotta figure out that Gilak and his boys. And Katara says, yeah, well, I mean, sure, but also, like, maybe he's right a little bit, right? Katara thinks this is exactly what happened with Aang and the meadow his people loved. Katara, just like Aang in that situation, knows how she feels, but everyone around her is telling her that that feeling is wrong. Well, we're here to report the bad news to Malik. We didn't get your briefcase back, and man, he's not taking it well. He's even throwing shade at the South Pole, saying that if this were the North, things would've went real different in that situation. Immediately, we get a demonstration of one of the points Gilak was making. He says the North has rules and regulations, but down here, it's like the Wild West, and you can almost feel him get to that Ice Savage line people like to throw around, but he doesn't. He seems unsure of Hakoda even following up on this and getting justice. He says what he and Malina are doing down here is so important, and Katara grills him like, what are you doing down here anyway? And Sokka says, come on, he and his wife are really helping out. But Malik says, no, 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 she's my sister, chill, chill, chill. Oh, that's only a little awkward, my bad. Anyway, let's go say hi to daddy-o, and oh my god, you're telling me Hakoda, the head motherfucker what's in charge, supermodel war hero, has a girlfriend? Oh, that's not gonna go over well. And that's where we end things off for this one, a Katara and Sokka solo journey, wasn't quite expecting that, right? Maybe because Aang is front and center on the cover, right? That's a little weird. Anyway, I think this one was pretty good, it got a lot done, introduced us back to the new Southern Water Tribe, and made sure we got to see the characters we wanted to see, and also introduced a lot of intricate points to play around with. It was teetering on being repetitive with the rift, I thought, with Katara hopes for her old home still being the same being dashed just like Aang's were. But I think the little twist being that Katara isn't on her own side thinking that, but actually on the antagonist side, is interesting enough to set it apart. Could it still end up being repetitive? Definitely. They're gonna have to try and set it apart for sure. But for now, I think it's good. It wasn't terribly character driven, honestly. It was mostly Katara and Sokka getting carted around from scene to scene, reacting to things. But for a comic that's setting things up, I don't think that's all bad. It's really shaping up to be Katara's book, since she's the one having an emotional reaction to the way things are changing. And I'm open to that big time. I think Katara's overdue for some development and some spotlight post-show. Patreon shoutouts, if you want to see two brand new videos from me, you can support me on Patreon for just a few bucks. Link, as always, is in the description below the video. Biggest shoutouts of all go to my top patrons, Agent Rhino, who went to Comic-Con once and was constantly swarmed by adoring fans, but they have no idea why. Danger Stranger, who developed a tool for picking an entire apple orchard in under one hour. Unfortunately, all the trees and everything will also be destroyed, and the rotational velocity of the planet will be brought into question, but man, it picks those apples. Gift Mr. Von PTA, who if he 
sings to a clam, it will always have a pearl on it. Omega Fighter, who won the Nose Ring Tug of War Championships, and the last match was against an ox. Sean Martin, who can read any YouTube link out loud and play it on his retina. Stephanie Riches, who keeps hearing about this breathing thing everyone has to do, but she's never done it and she's doing fine. Thomas Lautenbach, who took a selfie and put it up at an art auction, and he got some pretty steep offers. Tiago Nascimento, who had to dig his own grave on three separate occasions, and he's still around, so I mean, don't mess with that guy. Tis Just Lee, who built an entire log cabin with in-ground heating around a homeless lady in one night. A Varundo, who can step on a crack and transfer the backbreaking to anyone they want. And Whitrow, who took down an attack helicopter with a throwing axe in three separate wars. And of course, my god over analyzers, two boots are beat. Alex Rodriguez Flores, Andrew Watchard, Austin Gallup, Daniel Anderson, Devoted 221, Dizzy Payne, Dominic Saint, Distent, Aaron Grace, It's Carton. Jackson, John Ojaka, Justin Fletchall, Mr. Freese, Nicholas Abbott, Peter Bayron, Phil, Pogger White, Reese, Rocket Mist, Ryan Maxwell, Samuel Vanderplatz, Super Snipper, Turt Bobs, and some bare-faced thing, I don't know. Next up, I'm sure Sokka and Guitaro will do some shouting about this.